Welcome back. I'm back. Uh, <laughs> Anybody has a rock? <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a very different uh, project than what I talked about yesterday. Um, so the story of this project is very uh, interesting for me because uh, this was my second year as an assistant professor uh, when, uh, when I started working on this project. And uh, the, the problem that we were dealing with was as follows. Uh, initially, when I started uh, the professor, my students had access to, uh, you know, we were, we were poor when we started. So we, were, uh, we had access to these 10 gigabit links. And we were trying to run some real world applications, do some network measurements, and trying to understand what is happening. Um, and then one day, uh, somehow, we found ourselves some money, and we ended up having 100 gigabit links. Yes. So now we took those applications that we had uh, done a lot of fine tuning with on 10 gigabit links, and then started porting them on 100 gigabit links. Yes. I don't know how many of you have dealt with this, but it took us weeks to find good performance points when we had completely optimized our applications for 10 gigabits. And now we just ported them, and now we had to do all the things that we had done all over again. You know, we had to find the right way to schedule course, the right way to do load balancing, the right way to figure out what is the right uh, uh, number of threads, number of connections, and all that was a big mess. Uh, so we started thinking that uh, this transition is not going to stop. Right? At some point, we are going to move from 100 gig to 200 gig, 200 gig to 400, 400 to 800. And I don't know how many of you have spent how many hours in optimizing these things, but it is pain. If you can relate to that. And this is where we started thinking about uh, um, why uh, we are doing all this. In, and, and we were working with Linux, right? Uh, one of the more stable uh, operating systems. OK, so that's where this project started. Uh, this is the student who did uh, all the work. Uh, I should not say that in public, but uh, <laughs> this is a student who did all the work. He's, he's the amazing one. Uh, Chicha, he was also um, uh, on the work that uh, we talked about yesterday. And then uh, Jai, who some of you may know, he was a contributor for MPTCP, uh, actually helped us uh, a lot with the realizing this in the kernel. Uh, and Christos uh, from Stanford actually had a lot of interesting insights in this project. So. Uh, kudos to all of those who actually do work, um, and I get to give talks. Okay, so uh, what is the idea? What is the so? Let me the first half of the talk. I'm going to bring to you some of the problems that we faced right while executing this project, uh, or while while thinking about this project, and then I'm going to tell you um, some ideas on for you to ponder about uh, once once I'm done with the talk. So what do existing host network stacks look like? You have a certain number of cores on your server. Uh, each application that runs creates one or more sockets, uh, connections. Um, and then it passes on the data to the Linux network stack that does the, all the magic that it has to do and passes on to the NIC. Uh, this is usually uh, the, the pipeline that, uh, that, or the architecture that we think about today. Yes? Um, and. Uh, Based on talking to a lot of developers, a lot of industry people, a lot of academics, some of the problems that uh, people have talked about. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how many of you have love-hate relationship with Linux. Uh, I love Linux, but I also hate Linux some of those days, right? Uh, and I think all of us go through this. So some of the some of the things that people told me are the problem. The first one is, uh, hey, the packet processing pipeline is very inefficient, and this is where a lot of discussion goes on. Uh, how to optimize this packet processing pipeline, how to get more throughput per core, how to get more packets per core, and things like that. Um, and then uh, there is poor performance isolation, right? That uh, if I have some latency sensitive traffic competing with throughput bound traffic, uh, Linux does not provide the best possible isolation that we can get. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, latency bound traffic can suffer. A lot of people who actually try to push things into the stack talk about this very complex and rigid implementation. If I want to change something somewhere in the packet processing pipeline, I have to go and change hundreds of other places just to be able to make a tiny, teeny, tiny change. So very rigid and complex implementation. 
and inefficient transport protocols in many, many of these. Yes. So people cite all these problems with the Linux network stack, and we wanted to think which of these are really in the core uh, problems and which of these are solvable. So uh, these problems have led to many interesting debates yeah, in our community, in the academic community, and in industry on various design aspects. Right? For example, um, what should be the interface? Should we continue with the streaming interface? Should we go with RPC interface? Should we use IOU ring? There, you know, we, we are having all these debates almost on a daily basis. Yesterday night toward drinks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so there's an interface question, right? Um, there's also the semantics question. Should we have synchronous, asynchronous communication? How should we be dealing? And then there's the question about placement, which has got, uh, taken a lot of attention recently, right? That Hey, is Linux kernel network stack is the right place to implement functionalities? Should I implement something in the hardware? Should I implement something in the user space? Where do I get most of the benefit? A lot of debates um, and heated debates and fun debates uh, and no clear answers, right? Why? Because all of us are running different applications. All of us have different goals. And for a particular application or a particular goal, one of these choices might be better than the other choices. Yes. What I want to tell you a little bit today is that most of these limitations that we saw in the last slide, they are really not rooted in the interface semantics or the placement of the network stack functionality. They're really rooted in the stack architecture, the way we have designed or we have our Linux kernel network stack today. It's the architecture question. Okay, and by, my hope is that by the end of the talk, I'll be able to convince you that we need to rethink this architecture. What do I mean by architecture? I'll get in a, in a minute. But really, it's uh, many of these problems that we argue about on a daily basis are not about interface semantics or placement. Okay, so what is architecture? <clears throat> Since the very first incarnation of the Linux network stack, we have offered this pipe abstraction to applications, right? Uh, I have two machines connected to the network, one side NIC, another side NIC. What applications see is a pipe abstraction. I put data on one end of the pipe, I get data on the other end of the pipe. Yes. Um, and this pipe abstraction really looks something like this. I have some applications submitting to some socket queues or some, pick your favorite instance of the uh, interface. It goes into the stack, processing NIC goes on the other side. And when I instantiate this, uh, socket, I already tell the machine or the stack to do several specific things that we will get to. But this pipe extraction has been the core. So I'm going to focus on the left side. Imagine there is a sender there uh, or a receiver there, but I'm going to focus on one. So what do we have? These pipe abstractions, if we think about it, um, if I take the entire kernel network stack and just divide into, for simplicity of discussion today, into three layers. I have some interface level processing. I have some protocol processing and I have this uh, net device subsystem, right? And then the packets get into the NIC. So this pipe abstraction, my first uh, argument is that today, since the very first time of the uh, network stacks, we have had very dedicated pipes, right? Each application submits data to one end of the pipe and gets data to the other end of the pipe. It's dedicated in the sense that this pipe is the sole owner of that data. Okay. Okay, and the network stack delivers the data the other end. So I'm going to call it dedicated pipes, right? The second one is that these pipes are tightly integrated. Each pipe is given its own socket, is given its own transport layer, congestion control, flow control, whatever you want, and its own resources at the instantiation time. When the socket is instantiated, you give everything to that socket at that time. Yes, and the last one is also uh, slightly connected is that this pipe, all the resources that are allocated to these pipe are static. When we instantiate a socket, we do not ask how many other applications are running in parallel, how many resources are free, right? So these resources that are allocated to this pipe are completely static. They're independent of what other pipes I have in the system, they're independent of what resources are available and so on. So those dedicated, tightly integrated, and static pipelines are the real problem. Okay. Um, 
And these are the problems that uh, do not allow us to get all the performance that we can get from the network hardware. Okay, so that's uh, that's the goal of next few slides. I'll try to convince you about the statement that uh, this dedicated static and tightly integrated pipelines are a problem. Okay, so um, pipes uh, is specific uh, is specific pipe abstraction. Okay, so. Now what I want to do is show you some results uh, based on some measurements uh, and tell you a little bit about uh, this limitations of these dedicated tightly integrated and static pipelines. And then I want to tell you uh, what uh, a possible architecture could be that overcomes these problems. Okay. And then I'm going to show you some results on these uh, um, implementation of this architecture into the Linux network stack. Okay. Let's start with the first one. So, Let's see, so in this experiment, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to have two servers connected with each other, and I'm going to send a long flow uh, with large packets from one end to the other. And I'm going to set up this machine such that my link bandwidth 100 gigabits uh, uh, is greater than per core throughput, okay? So my per core throughput is less than 100 gigabits in this experiment. And what is happening is, once, once we run this experiment, we are going to measure uh, different uh, um, different points where the CPU utilization is going or where the CPU is spending its time. And I'm going to divide it into three high level primitives, inter interface level processing um, and uh, network layer processing and some others, okay? So interface level, you can imagine, this is uh, basically doing data copies. This is doing all kinds of uh, um, scheduling that needs to be done. Network layer processing is transport layer processing. Uh, you have to, and et cetera, and others will be scheduling overheads and all those things, yes? Um, <clears throat> the memory management, everything goes here. So net device subsystem. Okay, so in this experiment, not very surprisingly, what you can see is that uh, for long flows, most of the problem is coming out of the interface level processing, right? Because I have to do data copy, that's where a lot of cycles go today. Uh, and uh, in this particular case, long flows, uh, uh, in the case of long flows, most of the uh, CPU cycles are going into interface level processing. Okay, um, so here resources for interface level processing are limited by the number of application cores, right? Where the where whichever number of uh, sockets that you have allocated, that's where the bottleneck is. Okay, but that singleton point is not important, right? The point I'm going to show next is uh, the ideal thing would be that if I get stuck with some throughput, some bottleneck there, what I ideally want is to be able to dynamically say that, hey, my CPU cores for data copy, uh, or sorry, my data copy is taking too many CPU cores, and I'm becoming bottlenecked on the number of cores that I've assigned, I should be able to scale the number of cores for the same socket connection, okay? So if I have more cores available, I should be dynamically, the system should give you more cores that you are becoming bottlenecked on data copy, I will give you one more core for data copy and your throughput should increase, ideally, okay? So that's for long flows, but only for long flows, I want more cores for data copy, okay? Now let's look at short flows. Suppose now I start sending 64 byte packets between these two machines, okay? So I have very short messages. My link bandwidth is still greater than per core throughput. And what you see now is a very different pattern. Interface level processing takes very few cores now, but somehow network layer processing becomes the bottleneck. This should not be surprising for people who have done this, uh, these kind of measurements, that for short messages, your network layer processing becomes a bottleneck, okay? And what is happening here is that now suddenly, I'm spending a lot of energy into protocol processing and net device subsystem. So what is ideal would be, again, that if I'm stuck in this scenario where my short messages are not getting enough throughput, uh, then I should be able to dynamically scale the resources allocated to this layer, not necessarily the upper layer, yes? And today there is no way because there is a single pipeline, all tightly integrated. There is no way to be able to say, I need more cores for this part, I need more cores for this part of processing. Okay, so this is uh, another limitation. Um, now, the important thing to take away or the message to take away is that for long flows and short flows, the case is very different. And that's where we spend a lot of time optimizing the system that for each application, we have to figure out what the application is doing and do the optimizations for that particular case. But as soon as something changes, right, we have to redo all that fine tuning. In fact, you run some application, you do complete fine tuning, you get the best possible number. I just run one 
other process on that machine, the complete, all the fine tuning it did might break down. So, the different applications have bottlenecks at different parts of the pipeline, uh, not very surprising, and ideally we should be able to scale resources given to any specific part of the pipeline. Okay, so now, in this particular experiment, I'm going to show you a different problem. So, here, I have two applications running on this core, yes? Okay. So they both are doing the same thing. Somehow I, I allocated these two cores while creating the sockets that this particular sockets will reside on the same core. And if I want to see, if I run all of both of these applications in isolation, I want to see their performance and then see what happens if I co-locate them on the cores, yes? So, and I'm going to focus on the tail latency here. If I run only the latency sensitive application, I get good enough latency in this particular experiment around 75 microseconds, but suddenly when I co-locate it, with the throughput bound application, my latency inflates to a very large number. This should also not be surprising, right? Because these two sockets are coexisting on that core, and these two <coughs> these two sockets are coexisting on this core. And as soon as uh, uh, you know I start switching between latency bound app and throughput bound app processing, my latency inflates, right? What should the network? What should the stack do? Which it doesn't do today is realize that there's a problem and move there away. For example, if there's a free core sitting there, I should be able to move uh, this processing to the other core, right? This should be the job of the stack. But today, these two pipes are completely independent. They do not even know each other's existence and hence the stack does nothing for you. You have to go and do all these optimizations, okay? So what we really want to do is uh, uh, think about these problems and see if these dedicated, tightly integrated and static pipelines are really something that we should be stuck with or can we think of something different where the stack takes more responsibility. So, and my argument is that, uh, yes, for 10 to 100 transition, we were able to survive that, okay, we could do some fine tuning, right? As we see how the hardware is evolving, with all the fancy things that are being put in the hardware, the more and more applications that are uh, co-located, I think this problem is gonna get worse. Um, I think that as soon as we go beyond 100 gig lengths, uh, we have to re-architect the network stack because we will be spending ever more time in optimizing these things. Um, there are several academic papers that have actually pointed out that uh, in terms of the bottlenecks, for terabit ethernet, bottlenecks are shifting to the host, okay? Uh, there's the host network stack overheads paper, Swift paper from Google that pointed out that there's a lot of bottlenecks in, within the host and PCI performance actually is, uh, is uh, getting a lot of attention as well. So for these very high bandwidth links, uh, uh, if the bottlenecks are being pushed to the host, we will have to do more and more optimizations. More co-location of applications is going to lead to other problems. And I think that this dedicated, tightly integrated and static pipeline architecture was okay for internet and early generation data centers where bottlenecks were not in the host, but rather in the core of the network. But now that we are shifting the bottlenecks to the host, we will have to do all these optimizations. And at some point we will be forced to uh, re-architect this uh, stack. And we already know that, you know, we are already talking about it, that today's stacks are at the brink of a breakdown and the re-architecture is inevitable, I think. So the goal of this whole three years of uh, a project was to rethink this architecture. That okay, if we look into the future, um, say you know today, uh, what should this re-architecture look like? What responsibility should the kernel take? And uh, that's where the net channel project came up. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about this net channel architecture. Um, so what is the net channel architecture? It's saying that take these pipelines, this entire packet processing pipeline and we are going to disaggregate this uh, pipeline into multiple loosely coupled layers. In particular, uh, we will show that uh, if you take this pipeline, uh, what we are going to do is, uh, we are going to take these pipelines and have, first thing that we are going to do is make sure all the pipes, uh, even the disaggregated pipelines, share all the resources at the host, okay? I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, so we are going to enable shared resources across host, different parts of the pipelines, are decoupled. We know that we cannot have a tightly integrated pipeline all the way from CPU to the NIC, okay? So we should break it into 
different uh, layers. And then I should be able to dynamically allocate these resources based on the demands of the application. So if some applications have uh, low demands for the network layer processing, high demands for uh, the interface level processing, we should be able to dynamically allocate these resources based on other pipes and resource availability. So those are the three goals, okay? So we want a shared, loosely coupled, and dynamic architecture. So what should this architecture look like? Um, what we are thinking is that uh, uh, we should have the following three loosely coupled layers. So I'm going to go and tell you a little bit about each of these layers. Uh, the first one, the top one, what we are calling is the virtual network system layer. The second one is what we are calling net scheduler, and the bottom most is net driver layer. <laughs> do people see anything? Uh, what do you see? I see three layers. You see three layers? <laughs> Any of you who works on a storage? This is, this is the network. Ah, network. okay. Looks like the uh, CP NVMe, maybe. Very good. Uh, I will I will tell you a little bit about. So uh, let's let's keep this picture in mind for a second. So what is virtual network system doing? Uh, the virtual network system is basically a virtual file system. Uh, and uh, sorry, something is missing here. What is happening? Okay, good. So what we have is virtual network system, uh, net driver, and net scheduler. Some of you who might have looked into storage architectures. Storage people have done a similar architecture for years, many, many years. Why? Because the storage people had to solve exactly the problems that I'm talking to you about today. They had to solve many, many years ago, right? They had new devices coming up much more rapidly. They had to do all these optimizations inside the kernel, and they had to think about different schedulers for different applications. They had to talk about different interfaces, as we were evolving from SATA to NVMe, they had to do all these things. So they actually, many, many years ago, they made it much, much easier for people dealing with the storage stacks to do all those kind of things that I was just telling you about. So storage stacks actually have this architecture already. What we are stuck with is dedicated and uh, uh, static uh, and tightly integrated pipelines in the network stack. So what we are proposing is that network stacks take a re-architecture and actually look like this, okay? The storage stack. Um, <clears throat> okay, so these are the three layers. Let me tell you a little bit. By the way, in the storage stack, it's very similar. Device drivers, IO scheduler, and some interface, right? People, whenever a new device comes up, you write a new device driver. Whenever a new protocol comes up, you write a new de a device driver, right? You update your device driver. You have to change nothing else in the stack. The same thing here, when a new protocol comes up, you design a new protocol, you want to experiment with a new protocol, you go here and you write a new net driver. You want to optimize your system, rewrite a scheduler. You want to get good load balancing, you want to get good uh, resource allocation for your applications, you write a new scheduler. Multiple co schedulers can coexist, right? Interfaces, if you want a new interface, go ahead, change the file system and write a new interface. So we are proposing that uh, uh, us networking people rethink the architecture, and I believe the architecture storage people have already done most of the job for us, okay? So what is this, uh, uh, each of these layers in the network stack doing? Uh, the virtual network system is very similar to virtual file system. It provides virtual interfaces, okay? And these interfaces could be sockets, RPC. The important thing is it's a virtual interface, okay? Uh, which means applications just see queues some sort of queues, it decouples the interface level processing from rest of the pro uh, packet processing pipeline, okay? And I will show you some examples. The net driver actually abstracts out the entire NIC and the entire network and even network attached devices potentially as a multi-queue device. I have multiple output queues, I have a device, everything is abstracted out as different queues and things can happen between the network file system uh, abstractions and these queues you can have any kind of multiplexing or demultiplexing that you want. And uh, here, what we are suggesting is that we have this very basic channel abstraction. And this channel abstraction is basically operating on each queue. This channel can implement whatever protocol you love, okay? This channel abstraction is the one that implements whatever transport layer functionality you want, whatever lower layer functionality you want. Um, and uh, we think that with this abstraction, 
there will be much easier integration of new transport designs into the kernel stack uh, and we will be able to decouple the network layer processing as well, okay. And in the middle is this net scheduler layer, right, just like uh, block IO schedulers uh, where you will take the data that applications submit to any core that they are running on, right, uh, in the virtual abstraction, uh, virtual interface and then you can take this data submitted to any core and pass it on to any of the channels that is running on any of the other cores and process the data on that core, on that channel. Okay, so you could do multiplexing of data at the sender side from the application cores to any of the channels and then do demultiplexing of data at the receiver side. Okay, so you can, and you can write whatever favorite scheduling policies you want between these virtual interfaces to the, the uh, to the multi multi queue device interface, okay, uh, to the queues. So you can send the data from from the application core to this core. You, if if other applications become busy, uh, you can scale and place channels dynamically. You can have two channels at some point. You can have eight channels at other time. As the system gets busy, the system should be able to scale itself uh, as uh, resources become available. If I have multiple application sharing, I can actually separate them out. For example, in this particular example, if I have for some reason, I was I was co-locating one latency sensitive app and one throughput app on the core zero, one latency sensitive app and one throughput app on core one. The system should be able to schedule and reallocate the cores in a way that latency applications are isolated from throughput bound applications. And the network should be able, to, or the, sorry, network stack should be able to do that. It should not be the goal of person who is doing fine tuning to spend all the energy in doing this. Okay, so. So this net scheduler, just like block IO schedulers, enable very flexible scheduling policies that can be implemented between the device queues and the application queues. Okay, so these are the three layers, virtual network system, uh, net scheduler, and net driver. <coughs> so what would be an end-to-end -end operation here that, uh, that may look like? An application submits different packets. They might go to different cores for the virtual network system layer processing. Both the cores may process that and then you might send out those packets or whatever abstractions or whatever SK buffs, for example, or anything that you want to the lower level driver. And the driver processes them into different channels, right? And they can traverse the network along different channels. You get those packets back into this. And then you can actually decouple them again, process them on different cores, reorder them, and put it back to that. And it should be the job of network stack to be able to dynamically allocate all the resources that, in, uh, that are required in this processing. Okay, so the first technical challenge, or one technical challenge that you might imagine what happening is I'm taking an application, submitting data, processing it on different cores, and now submitting it through different potentially sockets within the network stack, right? So there's reordering problem, yes, but there's a head of line blocking problem that might happen. Uh, for example, I have two applications, application one and application two. For Because of these dynamically varying resources, what happens is application two submits the data and it goes for processing at application one core uh, where the channel is sitting. And now there are some blue uh, application uh, packets that are sitting behind this um, and uh, they might get blocked. For example, in this particular example, uh, I have this application goes here, the data goes here, but somehow the application two buffers, application two is not consuming the data fast enough. So in this buffer, I have application two data sitting in front of the application one data. Even though application one data is free, sorry, application one is processing data fast enough, I cannot process these blue packets and send it to the application. So there's a head of line blocking problem. Uh, this is a very standard problem. We know a lot of solutions. Uh, basically, the idea is that when this head of line blocking happens, you can come up with uh, per application queues within the net driver, which is what storage stack also does. Uh, and you can have a temporary uh, temporary um, uh, storage of this data within the driver queues and then forward it over time to the right applications. This is only a temporary solution, right? In the long term, what would happen is it could happen that these queues build up still and now you're not able to send the data. For that, similar to the storage stack, we propose that we use end-to-end -end flow control, right? So at some point, application level buffers will have to provide some feedback saying that, hey, all the buffers are filled, please do not send me the data. In that case, what would happen is the natural scheduling 
simplicity. These buffers will fill up on the sender side because that application is not consuming the data fast enough. Once these application buffers fill up, those blue applications will be scheduler. Based on the scheduler, they will be forwarded to the green one automatically. This is the scheduler uh, design now. It is no longer your goal to optimize, it's the scheduler goals to optimize. And you can avoid head of line blocking in the final world because of end-to-end -end flow control mechanism. Right? So we wrote a very simple scheduler and uh, using 25, 30 lines of code, it actually just works fine if you just look at the few occupancies. Right? But uh, uh, the point is not here to have a single scheduler. The point is that you can write your schedulers the way you want. Right? Uh, there will be some standard schedulers just like we have standard block IO schedulers, storage schedulers, and those schedulers will work for most applications, but multiple schedulers can coexist. And we don't have to do all that fine tuning every time uh, new hardware or new protocol comes up. Okay, so what can this enable? So I've only given you some of the details about the net channel architecture at a high level. Um, let me show you some of the interesting things that we have been able to do with very simple uh, scheduler designs. So this is a prototype implementation uh, that's running currently. Um, <clears throat> and what I want to show you, right now we have implemented it only as a kernel module. Um, I'm going to show you some results, uh, some interesting data points that we can get. Uh, and uh, uh, in particular, I want to show you these three interesting data points, okay? So using a single socket, we'll be able to saturate 200 gigabit uh, link. Uh, we will be able to scale short messages uh, processing throughput linearly and achieve microseconds when, even when there's huge contention at the host. So in the first case, long flow case, um, what, we, what net channel will do is application will submit data to one socket. At the net channel uh, core system, not the user, We'll be able to scale that processing across multiple cores and uh, submit it to different channels. Okay, and all the everything in this is completely dynamic. Okay, the system decides how many cores to allocate for the top layer. The system decides how many channels to allocate, and uh, <clears throat> the result is as follows. So, in the case of Linux, we get roughly 55 gigabits per second. This is long flow, so large packets, uh, 55 gigabits per second. And with net channel, we are able to completely saturate 200 gigabit link, not even writing a single line of code above the application. No fine tuning required. Net channel does this all automatically for you. Okay, you don't have to do any kind of fine tuning. There was basically a zero effort experiment. Uh, and the throughput per core is roughly the same. Okay. So we are not saying that we are improving per core performance, that is to the interface or hardware implementation where you want, but the channel will take care of everything else for you. Now let's look at short messages. I'm not going to change a single line of code within net channel. The same scheduler, the same net driver, and the same virtual file system. I'm now going to take short messages. In the case of Linux, I'm going to get roughly 10 gigabits per second, yes? And as I push more load into the system, basically, Net channel will dynamically allocate more cores and scale the throughput almost linearly. Again, you don't have to write a single line of code here. The system is dynamically allocating cores and increasing the throughput. So the high level takeaway here is that without any application layer optimizations, net channel will allow you to adapt to these emerging hardware for the long flow and the short flow case. Okay, good. So now one last experiment, and this is my favorite experiment. Here what we are going to do is, I'm going to have one latency bound application and eight applications that are just sending massive amounts of data, throughput bound applications, okay? And if you run it on Linux kernel, as I showed you some of the results, you will see uh, hundreds of microseconds and even milliseconds worth of latencies. Um, here we wrote a very simple net scheduler, uh, which was uh, just isolating latency bound apps from throughput bound apps, uh, but no changes in net driver or no changes in the interface layer, okay? and what the scheduler does is it basically isolates these latency apps from throughput apps. And the numbers here are, in the case of isolated, I have uh, the latency bound applications getting very good latency. When I start putting them with, uh, uh, with the co-located apps, in the case of Linux, we see roughly 20x increase in latency, but the net channel is able to adapt itself and reduce that latency down to bare minimum, less than 100 microseconds even in this case, right? And uh, all these applications, basically, Nick is running at line right here, almost at right here. I think we were at 98 previously. So net channel can also enable 
this kind of isolation policies, but one layer below the applications. Okay. So, uh, looking forward, I think this we have done only a basic uh, prototype implementation. Uh, you know, we are basically thinking of uh, uh, re-architecting the network stack would be useful. Uh, and the high level idea is that we should learn from other communities that have done this for many, many years, uh, in particular the storage community. This can actually simplify our life for many, many decades to come. Right, that's the goal. Uh, but of course, uh, this will require rethinking uh, or rewriting a uh, major part of the kernel, right? Uh, or at least breaking it apart into layers. Thinking about new scheduling policies as a community that we can build together. Uh, integrating new transport protocols will become much, much easier by writing new net drivers. Uh, and uh, you know, the the architecture that I described is not kernel stack. It could be useful for user space and hardware. Um, hardware designs as well. One last note is that NetChannel is again open source, everything you can go and run today. Um, it has been again evaluated by the community, different members of the community in parallel, uh, and all these results are, have been reproduced. That's where I will stop, um, and I can take any questions people may have. Yes, go for it, David. Hello? All right. Yeah. So we know that cache locality is a huge part of throughput performance. And by taking a single stream and spreading it across cores through the mem copy to user space, uh, presumably that app has to analyze that buffer linearly, right, to, to go through whatever's been landed. So how do you continue to maintain that performance through something like that? Yeah, so great point. Um, so here's where I think cache locality really matters. You are much more knowledgeable in this area, but uh, uh, here's where cache locality really matters, which is per core throughput, right? Yeah. But suppose you are limited by the number of cores your socket is currently using, depending on how you're doing packet spraying and flow steering and everything, right? Uh, sorry, packet spraying. Uh, packet steering, flow steering and everything, right? So suppose currently your socket is using two cores. One for the application side and one, let's say you're using RFS or you're using RSS, uh, yes? The point is, today you have no way to be able to use four cores or five cores unless you rewrite your application to use multiple threads or multiple connections, right? What NetChannel will do for you is to enable that without you fine tuning the number of channels or connect, number of threads or connections, right? So you're not, gonna, you're absolutely right that you're not gonna get the best throughput per core, but your throughput will increase as long as you are not completely trashing your cache everywhere. So, so assuming the application is written in a way to handle that data across multiple cores. Yes. But application is still dealing with a single socket. Application right, doesn't right. have to worry about the, so what will happen is hopefully there will be a net scheduler, right? That will be able to take this information just like CPU schedulers do and figure out the right way to schedule these packets in a way that we get the best cache locality. I, I think that's, that's really the point, right? Like you'll need to have a CPU scheduling, CPU scheduling scheme that is tied to the network scheduling scheme, right? Otherwise you end up across sockets and you have a huge problem on your hands. Yes. IPI will kill you, cache bounce will kill you. Yes, absolutely. So it could be that uh, CPU schedulers need to be tied with net schedulers or the net scheduler takes information from the CPU scheduler and dynamically allocates the uh, channels, right? They don't have to work in tandem, they just have to exchange information. Does that make sense? Yeah. Happy to talk more. Yeah. Yes? Uh, for the flow control use case on the TX side, how do you know that in net driver, some hardware queue is full? It's not something that's exposed from the driver. So that depends on how you design your net driver, right? One. Uh, if you look at the storage stacks, drivers expose their queue sizes, queue occupancy all the time. But not uh, status. Size, yes, but you don't know how much uh, packets you have in this queue. So how... Ah, oh, so you're looking on the queue disk, not on the... Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, you also have the queue counters. I mean, the, the indices can be... This is, this is not a hard problem. Yeah, but uh, counter doesn't say you that status of the queue. 
no, you will get the head and tail or something, right? I mean, all you need is head and tail to find out what the occupancy is because uh, if the hardware has not updated the tail, then you know that uh, that's how, how deep the queue is. This yeah, information it, is, is... It's exposed you know, to the... It's not exposed to the stack. That's a choice. That's what he's saying. That That's adding two variables to the net driven difference. Yeah, so I think good question. The the thing is, once you start thinking about this architecture, right, it will lead to new ideas that will allow people to expose new um, counters of some form, right? The thing is that we have to rethink the architecture. Sorry. Uh, somebody get yeah, Alex a so mic. Some of those counters will be available today, right? But as people realize that, hey, I could implement new oh. functionalities in this way. Hopefully, new drivers will emerge as well, right? That will that will give you more functionality to design better schedulers, for example. This happens all the time uh, in both the storage hardware side and the storage driver side. But yes, I think you have a follow-up. Yes, good. Yeah, I, I also have a question uh, here. <laughs> oh, here, sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> What's the split, for example, for the TCP stack between those layers? That's the first question, for example. Because, Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, what is the split of the TCP stack between the layers? Because, for example, we know that our axe needs to go to our thread because otherwise we will be not good. Uh, and yeah, the OK, so let's take yeah. that one first. So first point, let me first answer the, your question. Mm -hmm. And then I will say something about your comment. Yes? Okay. okay. So to answer your question, each of these channel abstractions should implement their own transport layer. Yes? So the but transport on the, on the net driver layer yes. or yes, net driver layer should implement all the transport functionality. Yeah, because currently net driver expects frames which are encoded, right? It's like, you know, it, it doesn't handle TCP mo in most cases. You're absolutely right. So this is this is a re-architecture. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we will have to change our thinking and rethink a little bit how we mm -hmm. should do this, right? So my suggestion is that each transport protocol has its own driver, right? That's implemented as a network dri net driver. Maybe multiple transport protocols can also coexist, yes? But net driver is where transport functionality should end, okay? Mm -hmm. Axe, now your point was today, Axe have to go all the way to the application threads. Yep. You should ask if this is fundamental. Do we really it's need not. that? It's not. Yeah, right? like the, this, this This actually is a good segue to the second question because the difference between the storage and network the subsystem right now is that storage is designed uh, based on asynchronous queues, so where you have your all your completions and so on. So basically, uh, if, if you move that to the net driver layer, then it basically solves that issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, actually, that, I mean, that's kind of true. Red blocks have block completions as well, so which goes up to his equivalent of the block layer queues. But I think you still, you have to think carefully about whether you're completing things that are network packets at the net driver and whether you're completing Fantastic. Yes. the protocol. Layer. The point is that anything that's related to net network, right, should finish at the net driver layer, mm -hmm. right? Network transfers. After that, it's host responsibility and we should be able to dynamically allocate host resources mm -hmm. to processing, local processing based on net scheduler policies. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is, there should be a very clear division. Sorry, I'm talking like an academic. Uh, but <laughs> the point is that there should be a clear division, right? Uh, but uh, hopefully as practitioners, you should see the benefit that could come out of this architecture, right? That you don't have to spend months and years optimizing your stack for every other application, every new application that comes up, every new hardware that comes up. You're spending weeks, months of human hours optimizing that today, right? We can continue on this path forever, or we can take a break, take six months, rebuild the system, at least start rebuilding the system, and say that this is a long-term solution rather than a short-term optimization strategy. Yeah. Hi, uh, Bols Pismani, NVIDIA. Um, I have two questions. Both yes. question. NVIDIA uh, people always ask uh, hard questions. You know. I'll, Plus, I'm, I'll, I'll I, was, I was telling him yesterday, I'm still confused whether I should call you NVIDIA or Melnock. Yes, in, in video. Um, <laughs> okay. So, so the first question is: um, so this interface introduces uh, reordering by design, and I, I suppose you, you need like a different protocol or some way to handle that. Is there a way to do it without it? Sorry, uh, the first part of the question. Reordering, like packets go to different queues and then they come out out of order on the network. So this is sort of an issue. It requires significant changes. 
Do you have like an approach that avoids that maybe or like yeah. doesn't how to do that? Yes, yes, yes. Very good question. So I discussed, that was the only technical problem that I discussed because, uh, you know, I saw that coming. Uh, so yes, you're absolutely right. Packets can be multiplexed at the sender side, go to different uh, channels uh, and different instances of TCP connections, right? And at the receiver side, I receive these packets out of order. And in fact, it could be that uh, some packets are blocked. Uh, and so my socket is not seeing a continuous range of packets. Um, there, there are multiple ways to think about this. Uh, one is out of order delivery is a reordering issue within the virtual socket, a virtual interface, right? Within the interface, I can do reordering. Today, it is hard because we are tied application to the socket interface, right? So we enforce that package be put in that interface in a sorted order. But if I decouple socket from the applications, right, then this is just a queue and I can reorder packets, right? Uh, just to give you an example, I, I know for networking people, it's very hard to imagine this, right? No, no like sometimes it's really important. You have a commit and you can't uh, have uh, the commit being reordered compared to the data if you're yes. doing storage. Uh, like but imagine, imagine what would this lead to, right? It would lead to slightly more delay at the net driver layer. That my packets are sitting there because the correct order packet has not arrived, right? Or it might be sitting in the virtual interface layer, depending on how you implement it, that I have to do some reordering. It will take some CPU cycles. But we could do that. Yes? And yes, this would not be a zero effort, but uh, you have to balance it out with how much effort we are putting in today to optimize our application side, right? So you're absolutely right that there's extra work to be done at the layers because of reordering, but the benefits are massive. I showed you that we can just saturate 200 gigabit without doing anything. Yes. So second question. Second we, are, question. we are going to run out of time, so make it quick. So the second one is philosophical, so take it wherever you want. The storage stack is essentially handling slow devices with fast software. And with Nix, we have the other way around. So uh, like, how does uh, uh, being inspired by storage helping networking? Uh, I'm not sure. You think storage devices are slower than networks? <laughs> At least uh, recent history. Uh, uh, I, I, I mean, you can get a terabit disk today. Get a get big enough credit card and uh, go buy it. Uh, I mean, so I think I agree with you in some sense. But if you if you look at at least my experience, uh, you might have other experiences. My experience is that uh, network layer latencies are actually much higher than storage latencies. Yes, I showed some numbers yesterday in cloud providers uh, if, across the data center. You easily get 200 microseconds, 300 microsecond latencies uh, on on average, right? Uh, storage devices, NVMe devices today get you an answer within 100 microseconds, 80 microseconds actually, right? Um, maybe unload it. Uh, yeah, so uh, yes, I don't, I, I, I am not saying I have all the answers, right? Uh, but the point is, can we, do we want to rethink? Sure. That's, that's the question, yes? Thank you. I would say let's finish with some of the other papers that are coming later in the day. I think there are some more perspectives here that we should. Oh, yeah, lunch. Okay, fine. Yes, plus if anybody is interested in having more discussions over drinks, that's where my creativity really comes out. It's a, it's a three drink minimum. Uh, yeah, thank you all. Thank you for thank bearing you, with me. Richard. So we're going to break now. Yeah, it's uh, break time. Do you want to stop the session? Uh, is it 30 minutes, I think? Yeah, we're back up to this. There's a lot of overlap. So, you know, things like the TP layer.